Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We will get started in just a few minutes once everyone logs in. So take a minute to stretch, get a notepad and pen so you can take some notes during our great webinar. Thank you all for being here. Welcome everyone again. Thank you all for being here. We'll get started in just a minute or so. Welcome everyone. Really glad that you've decided to spend an hour of your day with us. I'm going to give everyone another 30 seconds or so to log in before we begin today's webinar. So happy to see all of you joining. Again, welcome everyone. We so appreciate you being here today. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we have some fabulous um, content to share with you today. This is gonna be a really great learning opportunity from some fabulous panelists, our invited guests. So my name is Katie Elder, Vice President of Business Innovation at Points of Light, and I am delighted to be here with you. We've got an excellent webinar planned for you today that centers around empowering and equipping employees to help drive and scale your company's social impact strategy across its footprint. Before we dive in though, I'd like to provide a little bit of background information and context prior to inviting our fantastic panelists to join me. So first, for those of you who may not be familiar with Points of Light, we are a global nonpartisan nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to take action that changes the world. We work with companies, nonprofits that need community members to support their mission, and individuals interested in doing good. We were founded more than 30 years ago with the belief that people are the most powerful force for change in the world, and that individual actions, no matter how small, have an impact. And by taking action, we can solve the world's most pressing problems. Nowadays, we know that action takes all shapes and forms. So we've introduced our civic circle framework, which you see on the screen, that represents all the ways an individual makes a difference from traditional volunteering, to voting, to public or military service, to using their purchase power for good, to even choosing the kind of company they wanna work for, one whose values align with theirs and that seeks to make a positive impact in the communities where they operate. Which brings me right, right back to why we're here today. Whoops. Why are we here today? <laughs> because the company you chose to work for believes in doing good and is interested in providing opportunities for their most important asset, their employees, to live out their purpose. Our objectives today are for each of you to learn more about these people-centric models, why they matter, how things have changed in the past three years, and why they might be more relevant than ever. We'll showcase how leading companies are structuring their champion models, how they continue to keep employees interested and engaged in those programs, and our wise panelists will also share some road bumps they've hit along the way. But don't fear, they'll also leave you with some advice to take back to your team. So. Let's dive in, shall we? So employee champions in the workplace play a unique role. And you might call them something different based on your corporate culture, like volunteer leaders, ambassadors, purpose agents. But the intention behind the name is incredibly similar. For example, at some companies, champions might lead well-managed, sustainable volunteer projects that provide their employees with a meaningful experience while meeting a partner's identified needs. 
They might be the ones working locally to determine a community's needs and can help source the partners a company should work with to help solve those needs. They might be your megaphone to help recruit for upcoming events or communicate campaigns to their department or market. In a sense, they hold the key to unlocking a company's potential for acting on their organizational values and purpose while scaling the company's impact and creating a welcoming and inclusive culture. But that's not all. By acting as a champion of your company's social impact efforts, they can unlock their own potential and purpose, elevating their confidence and voice, creating new connections, internal and external to the company, and they tap into their own skills and strengths. Kind of sounds like the best leadership development program, right? So you might drop that hint the next time you're discussing this with your HR counterparts. And one last point, this role allows a champion to do the same for their colleagues and much more. Champions help them find causes and organizations that they can become passionate about. They might introduce them to their own new talents, new relationships, and new ways to engage in their community. By serving as a champion, these employees are actually helping to break down real and perceived barriers to getting involved. In fact, research that Points of Light conducted in 2020 told us that three in 10 adults did not volunteer in the past year, but were interested in doing so. When questioned further, 66% of those surveyed didn't believe they could make an impact in their community. 40% didn't know what to do that would be helpful, and 44% weren't sure how to get involved. And we know, especially those of you in the audience, we know the old saying really rings true. You're more likely to volunteer once you've been asked. And these champions help you as a CSR leader invite everyone at your company to take an active part in the change they wanna see in the world. But we know nothing that sounds this good could be easy, right? To design, implement, and sustain. And are these champion models still effective? now that we have companies that have gone fully remote or instituted a hybrid work environment. And I'll admit, points of light, got a lot of questions about the role of champions over the past three years as companies began rethinking their social impact strategy and infrastructure as they dealt with the impacts of the pandemic, along with headcount and budget constraints due to inflation and a looming recession. I spent time in conversation with members of Points of Light's Corporate Service Council, which includes more than 100 Fortune 1000 companies, to find the answers, and I've compiled them as much as possible into our newest learning brief, which is specific to employee champions and councils. We'll actually drop a link to the chat right now so that you can download the paper and continue exploring the benefits of these models. Now, I couldn't fit it all into the paper, unfortunately, though, so... I'm extremely proud to have three amazing CSR leaders on the webinar today to really bring these models to life. But before I do that, let's hear from all of you. We'll do a, two quick polls to gauge what's on your mind. Kyria, my teammate here at Points of Light, if you'll launch those polls now, please. Thank you. So audience, if you'll take a minute to answer the questions that you see on the screen, the first one is just telling us if you're using one of these models or thinking about using one of these models. And then the second question is, what do you think are the main concerns or challenges to implementing such a model, either from speculation or from actual real experience that you've had implementing or designing one of these champion models? And feel free to share those answers with us, share your responses in that poll. First one is, of course, single choice. The second one is multiple choice. And we will go ahead and close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Wonderful. Kiri, if you don't mind sharing the results with us. All right, so you can see where our attendees are here. Um, thinking about gathering or thinking about implementing the model. So you're gathering intel now. That happens to be number one. That's great. This is exactly why you're here today. And then let's take a look at the second question. 
capacity to manage and sustain. That seems to be a highly regarded challenge, unfortunately, because we know we're all busy with doing many, many things. Great. Thank you guys for sharing your thoughts with us. So we are going to move on now and I believe introduce our panelists. So we're going to get now to the heart of our discussion. We have uh, three talented CSR leaders, Diane, Melissa, and Rachel, who are going to join us. These three leaders are truly the champions of champions and have much to share with you about their experiences leading these networks. I'm going to invite them to join me on screen now. And as they pop on, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can pull out my hard hitting questions. All right, ladies. So I am actually going to introduce each one of our panelists one by one so they can provide our audience with a little bit of information on the history and core responsibilities of their network of champions. That way we can all get more familiar with their programs and what champions help them achieve. After our discussion, we'll take a few questions from the audience. So please feel free to add yours to the questions feature, which should be located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I've got some talented colleagues behind the scenes helping me look through those questions and we'll um, share those once we get to the audience Q&A portion. So first, I'd love to introduce you to Diane Hauser, Senior Program Manager at City. In her role, Diane focuses on skills-based volunteerism within the City Volunteers team, working to provide a full spectrum of employee engagement opportunities to colleagues around the world. She's committed to connecting colleagues to their philanthropic passions through cutting edge technology that supports volunteerism and providing technical assistance and capacity building to city's community partners. Diane has more than 18 years of experience in the CSR space and was instrumental in the creation and growth of the firm's annual flagship Global Community Day campaign. Diane, welcome. Would you mind sharing with us an, uh, a little bit more about the champion model at City? Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here representing my City Volunteers team, um, and I'm eager to share some of our more successful uh, processes today. We are currently a team of six that sits within our community relations function, and our role is to provide the resources and tools that our colleagues need to be empowered to create and lead volunteer opportunities. We have a really strong and mature volunteer program at City that's been around since 2004. And we're also a global company with more than 215,000 colleagues in 95 countries and territories around the world. So it's a big, big lift. Um, when we went to build our volunteer network, we did it very strategically since we couldn't magically transport ourselves to be at every single event. Therefore, we made the decision to create a model by which we could delegate the event planning processes to a network of volunteer champions across city's footprint. This all kind of percolated up in 2005 in a response to a senior leader um, who wanted to create a global day of service for the company. And that's when we really began to build out our global infrastructure. We started with the lowest hanging fruit, our international public affairs officers and community relations officers in the US who already had a grant making role and since they already managed a facet of those relationships with nonprofit nonprofit partners it was logical to have them be our boots on the ground in the volunteer space as well next we rolled in the community outreach officers within our employee inclusion networks who also already had community service as part of their bylaws and at this point we stopped we surveyed our global markets to determine the countries, states, and cities where we had coverage and where we didn't. And then to fill those gaps, we reached out to business heads to assign someone to act as a volunteer ambassador. And this could have been, you know, the City Solutions Center site leader, um, someone in HR, the communications lead, or even their administrative assistant. Um, these folks were kind of voluntold, but sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, and then lastly, we tapped our regional public affairs officers to play kind of an oversight role in their region and really try to cascade messaging 
to their local volunteer managers to avoid bombarding them with requests since they are wearing multiple hats they're doing grants for the foundation they're crafting you know communications and receiving messages from those teams too so we wanted to be mindful that we were not overloading the field with information building this infrastructure was critical at the time um, we were a team of three uh, versus 350,000 plus colleagues around the world. So there's no way that we could keep things centralized and be effective. Nor did it really make sense for us to try to strictly mandate what our sites were doing as, you know, there's different community needs in different markets. And it was important that we empowered our volunteer managers to help meet those specific needs. Their role was, and still is, to cultivate nonprofit relationships, to curate and post local volunteer opportunities in the City Volunteers platform, to help recruit volunteers, and to manage their volunteer event roster once the event is over. They also help log hours and remove colleagues who didn't attend. And additionally, for the majority of events, the volunteer manager or one of their delegates is expected to attend and ensure that the event runs smoothly, you know, give their welcoming remarks, explain to the volunteers why their service with the community partner matters, introduce any senior leadership or other speakers, and of course, make sure that the folks are engaged and having a good time. Wonderful. Thank you, Diane, for giving us that quick overview of how it works at City. I'll introduce our next panelist now. Melissa Abbott is a senior program manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where she oversees the work of the HPE Foundation and HPE's community investment strategy. Since joining the team in 2017, Melissa has managed nonprofit partnerships, the foundation's grant portfolios, employee engagement program, and works closely with other teams on strategic priorities, including DEI and human rights. Welcome, Melissa. If you'll take a minute to give us a quick overview of the champion model at HPE. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Katie. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to share the way that we've organized our champions and answer any questions you have. But um, just to give you some context, we are now a team of three driving our engagement and partnerships across all of the foundation. One of those pieces being our employee engagement program, which we call HPE Gives. We heavily rely on our champions network to have our um, program succeed. Um, We've had it for many years now, but it's continued to evolve um, over the years based on ongoing needs, adjusting priorities, and we've really adapted it according to what is the environment of the time. So uh, as of today, our core network consists of about 90 champions globally. Um, that includes one to two team members from our main sites across the US and a lot of our sites um, globally. And the mission of our Champions Network is really to empower team members to utilize their skills, passion, and creativity to support the communities where we live and work. Now, what does that mean? Put really simply, our champions are our eyes, ears, and voice on the ground around the world. Um, HPE has over 60,000 team members globally, and we are very cognizant in the fact that our team cannot know what is important to every team, every site, every culture, um, you know, the different ways of life, of communicating. So we aim to empower our champions to really take our messaging and uh, communicate it as as it makes sense on the ground in their culture. Um, so a little bit about their responsibilities. Like I said, it's really to drive the culture of volunteering and giving throughout HPE. It's to motivate, encourage, and inspire our team members to get involved at the local level. Um, for some of our larger sites, it's um, their responsibility to recruit others to help support them in their work. Um, and, you know, develop local committees of champions. Um, and we really rely on them to make those local connections on the ground, engaging with no local nonprofits, um, identifying those areas of interest for team members and driving that engagement. 
And then arguably most important to me is um, the feedback that they can provide us. What's working, what's not, how is our message resonating with the global teams and how can we better support to make sure that the team members are engaging um, in a way that's meaningful for them. And we have that continued engagement. Um, a few other pieces, they're required to facilitate at least one um, giving or volunteer event each quarter, so for a year. Sometimes this seems like a lot to scale, but we say that they just need to facilitate or communicate. That means that it's not their responsibility to do it from start to finish, but to really stay engaged with others, um, either resource groups, local site councils, things like that, and be that connection to make sure that all of our team members are rallied around the same causes, working together and continuously engaged. Um, there's other little things like monthly meetings to stay engaged that have really worked with us. Um, and uh, also for champions who decide that they are no longer able to participate, you know, we all have changing roles, different time constraints. We rely on our champions to find a replacement because they know who the most active team members are at their site. They know who has the connections to the existing partnerships with nonprofits and who may be able to build ones. So I know I just said a lot, but just to summarize it, the responsibility of our champions are to be informed, inspire, and connect. Be huh. informed, come to our meetings, stay engaged with your local communities, inspire your team members, drive engagement, and connect with your resource groups, your site councils, your local nonprofits, to really know what's happening um, and to have the most impact that we can have. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. And I love the comment about succession planning too, because I've heard that, that can often be a challenge when you have folks who have to drop out for whatever reason. So thank you for sharing. Um, and our last fabulous panelist today, please welcome Rachel Kimball, Community Outreach Program Manager at Southwest Airlines. Rachel is responsible for enterprise team volunteerism and external board service for Southwest Airlines executives. She also manages strategy for the Southwest Airlines Employees Catastrophic Assistance Charity, try saying that three times fast, which provides financial assistance to employees in times of crisis. As a trusted advisor on the CSR technology team, she flexes her analytical skills working on tools and solutions for managing Southwest Airlines work in grant making and volunteerism. Rachel, we're so glad you're here. Please jump in and share a little bit about the role of volunteer ambassadors at Southwest. Thank you so much for having me. And it's so great to hear just from my own point of view from Melissa and Diane, um, what your experiences are. So thank you both for being here and teaching me as well. Um, so I start, well, first of all, the Southwest Airlines Employees Catastrophic Assistance, Assistance Charity, even I trip on it still <laughs> sometimes, we call it the, the ECAC or the yeah. SWAT ECAC. <laughs> um, well, I've been at Southwest Airlines now for eight months. So um, one of the things that really attracted me to this company um, was the culture of caring and um, the philosophy in general at Southwest is to hire kind, smart people and then train them to do the job that they need to do. And that feeds directly into the baked in heart that all of our employees have, that they care about their communities, they want to be involved. So we're very fortunate to have such a strong culture of volunteerism at Southwest Airlines. Um, we call our champions uh, volunteer ambassadors. Um, we have about 200 right now. We're looking to fill some vacancies as we kind of refresh post-COVID, hopefully get up to that 300 number. Uh, but we have 70,000 employees in over 100 cities across the country that we are um, trying to plug into their communities and get involved. And so the role of our volunteer ambassadors is threefold, very similar to yours, Melissa. It's share information on our company-wide volunteer efforts, which are things like Earth Month. Uh, we sponsor two company-wide dinners every year for the Ronald McDonald House in their local areas. Um, and then we're also starting a Heart and Action Month in November 
to encourage employees to get involved. And so we want the ambassadors to be out there in the field sharing that information and encouraging them to make sure they're logging their hours and that they understand how we recognize and reward our employees for doing that. Um, the second thing is that we just encourage uh, or we ask them to encourage their cohorts to find what they're passionate about. Um, plug it, find a way to plug in, you know, in their own community with an organization that uh, matters to them. We call that putting their heart in action. And then the third thing is um, just connect and lead. Um, just connect with those community partners, lead your teams in uh, organizing events for the causes that are specific to your team that you care about. And um, we support them along the way throughout the year with resources to be able to do that. Wonderful. I, every time you say cohort, I want to if you guys <laughs> All right, that probably goes on in your hallways. Uh, yeah. Proverbial <laughs> hallways. All right, ladies. So thank you, Rachel, for sharing that quick overview. I'm now going to turn to our hard hitting questions. And Diane, you happen to be first on my list here. So I know when we talked earlier this month um, that pre pandemic, you had more than 500 of these champions around the world. And I'd love to ask first, how in the world did you keep track of them? And second, what tools have you developed to support and empower your volunteer managers? Yeah, so we're a bank. So as you can imagine, we have some pretty formal processes around tracking. Um, all of our volunteer managers need to apply through a city marketplace request that needs to be approved by their manager. And then our global information security team actually assigns that advanced access role in our city volunteers platform. My team is then able to pull a distribution list of volunteer managers back out of the system, um, which we use to then communicate directly to them via email and regular newsletters. For example, during our Global Community Day campaign, which is our day of service or month of service as it currently is, um, newsletters play a critical role in letting our volunteer managers know where they should be in the event planning and recruitment process. Um, we've really kind of crafted a, a, a well-oiled machine that kind of gets us through that campaign. Um, our internal communications team works very closely with us when it comes to storytelling and regular messaging that goes out to all colleagues to remind them to sign up for events and share the exciting activities that are happening in other markets. But we've also created a resource room where we provide all of the event management resources to ensure consistency in our programming and also uh, soup to nuts event management tools. Um, that includes event guidelines, sample communications to nonprofits and to volunteers. Uh, we have a t-shirt ordering process for North America and for our international colleagues. We have graphics for posters um, and digital communications and also social media posting guidelines. Lastly, we provide live and recorded trainings on how to optimize usage of the City Volunteers platform, which is where we expect all events to be posted. That's amazing. I would love to get into your resource room and <laughs> see all of those wonderful things. There's about put. 80 documents in there, so I'm not sure you'd want to actually go in there. <laughs> well, I love it because it speaks to like we want to empower these employees to you know and have the tools at their fingertips whatever they might need and depending on how long they've been a part of the program or if they're new they may need all 80 they may only need a handful right exactly thank you all right so obviously there's no shortage of interest to become a volunteer manager at city and i am now curious to know how the selection or identify identification process works at southwest airlines simply because of the unique nature of your employee base, Rachel, you, you're in, in airports and cities are, are across the nation. Tell us about that. That's right. We have employees in all kinds of roles, front frontline workers, headquarters, all of it, even remote employees that are full-time remote. Um, last year was interesting. We hired 18,000 people last year. So we have a new wave of excitement that has come into the company. So um, the interest has just skyrocketed post COVID um, of people who are looking to serve in their communities. Um, we are in the midst of a 
refresh right now. We are um, creating some new resources and toolkits and confirming interest uh, in serving. Um, but we really wanted to um, make it known that volunteerism is for everybody. If this is something that you're passionate about, we want the door to feel open to you to lead in that capacity. So on purpose, we have a very low barrier to entry to become a volunteer ambassador, as opposed to some of our other councils that require you know, formal applications and review processes. Um, and so it's a really good gap for leadership opportunities for our employees who are looking for ways to develop those skills. Um, and so we kind of have about three ways that employees can become a volunteer ambassador. Um, they can submit on their own an interest form that we have available on our internal uh, SharePoint site that they can fill out to express their interest. Um, they can be recommended by a leader or their station manager, we call airport stations, um, or they could be maybe recommended by their culture ambassador, which is kind of a um, a complementary group of people who serve in each station for each work group who know all the people they're really involved in culture building activities at all of our stations and so they they know who to recommend mm -hmm. who is already involved in the community um, and so once we get that recommendation or that interest form um, we make sure that they're very clear on the role that they're going to play as a volunteer ambassador and then we also do require a leader approval form, which just confirms they're in good standing. They're going to represent the, com the company well out in the community and those types of things. So it's a fairly simple process on purpose. Got it. Love it. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing. I love a low barrier to entry, but I also love vetting the employee just right. to be sure <laughs> they exactly. are the right ambassador um, for the company and our brand. Okay, Melissa. You've created a unique structure with your HPE Gives Champions in order to sort of streamline your team's work and communications with this group. You shared a little bit of that, of that within your overview, your introduction. Will you tell us a little bit more about that structure with our, so that our audience can understand more about the model in general, how it works at HPE? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the introduction, I said how we have 90 champions around the world. The, the globe. Um, and this is really our core group of champions. But to expand upon that, um, we structure our champions to have ideally one to two champions dependent on site size. For every site in the US and for every country we operate in across the globe. Um, beyond that, we really empower our team members, especially at the larger sites, to create local committees or councils so that they have support, they have a designated group that they're all working in unison to continue to support the program, continue to be champions as a group. Um, so when you think of it in that context, those local champions, we probably have several hundreds of <laughs> champions around the globe. The reason we do it this way, one is because the size of the sites, the needs of the sites vary. So we wanted to have some type of structure that's adaptable to the needs of the sites, but even more so it is, I don't wanna say selfishly, but kind of selfishly for us, we, didn't know how to manage hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So we find that it's a lot easier to have these designated one to two contacts per site or country that we know that we can reach out to if we have questions, concerns, requests. And at the same light, we're only receiving questions, ideally, from one or two people, not six, seven, 10, 15, 20 <laughs> from the different sites that could escalate. So it's a really, it's a way of streamlining our work and making sure that we have that person to go to if we need to around the world. With that being said, I mentioned how we have monthly calls, we have other resources. Others are invited to that. It gets forwarded a lot and that's fine. We, we encourage that. A lot of team members wanna hear it directly from our team and that's fine. But like I said, it's really a way to streamline our communications, 
making sure that we have clear and concise messaging and also for that feedback because when you have one or two contacts in these countries they are oftentimes i find more com comfortable coming to you when you have that personal touch that you know this worked really well this didn't land as well in our culture or in our communications, things like that. Um, so we found that this tiered approach is more manageable for us and ultimately more impactful for our program. I love it. Also, just sort of reinforcing the notion that companies, all different sizes, industries, cultures, like it's important to find a model that really works best for you to achieve your goals, but also to support the employees who are supporting the work of, of your social impact team. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope our audience clues in on, you know, there is no one right way to set up a champions model or a committee model throughout your footprint. Okay, Diane, back to you with this hard hitting question. I know you've seen nothing but changes over the past two decades that you've been involved in this work. Could you share one or two of the top challenges you and your team have overcome as you continue to steward this model especially maybe over the past three years? Yeah, I've, I've been at the company so long, sometimes I feel like I'm going to die there, but um, <laughs> the pandemic kind of gave me deja vu um, <laughs> all the way back to the 2008-2009 financial crisis where we saw mass layoffs followed by a round of mass hiring. Um, and as I'm sure is the case for most of you, the pandemic really had a significant impact on how we operate. Um, a whopping 70,000 new colleagues joined City over a 16-month period. Guys, that's almost a third of our official headcount that is new. Um, additionally, now we have a hybrid work environment in most markets with lots more telecommuters than in-office workers than ever. So our biggest challenge as a team is really rebuilding our volunteer culture. How do you get new folks engaged and keep morale up for colleagues that are remaining after the great resignation um, and that are new and have no idea that city volunteers even exists? So one way is to encourage sites to use volunteerism as a team building and morale building activity, really as a way for colleagues to reconnect with each other, especially as we're all starting to come back into the office um, for management to reconnect with their teams and also to really connect colleagues that are new to city's mission of enabling growth and progress. We're also developing new skill based volunteer programming so that way our volunteer managers will have more opportunities to plug into. Additionally, we went from that high number of 500 plus volunteer managers to about 170 right now so we are mainly you know we were mainly doing acts of kindness and virtual volunteerism versus in-person activities during the pandemic so a lot of folks just didn't have relationships with nonprofits that were able to do um, virtual activities um, and so they kind of stepped away or they left so now that the world is opening back up and we're expecting there to be many more in-person engagements we are also working on a strategy to try to rebuild that volunteer manager network but the good news is that there are a large number um, of folks who are just excited at the return of in-person activities so we don't think it'll be too difficult to find those passionate people to help us execute our programming globally i, I agree I absolutely agree, Diane, especially with all those great resources that you have created for them. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So continuing along that theme of changes and challenges, I'd love to ask both Rachel and Melissa how the pandemic impacted or influenced your thoughts on the effectiveness of the champion model or the work of your employee champions. Rachel, I will turn it over to you first. Sure. Thank you. Well, um, if you weren't living under a rock, you knew that the airline industry was hit particularly hard during the pandemic. All of our business operations essentially came to a, a screeching halt. And so we were in survival mode. Um, however, I will say Southwest Airlines is proud to say that we're the only airline that did not 
and has not ever um, had to do any layoffs or furloughs. So even during the pandemic, we did not do that um, as other airlines were forced to do. Um, so that uh, that means that our workforce did shift though. So um, everybody went remote, like, you know, everybody, every other company did mostly. Um, but some of those changes have been permanent for us. We have our technology team now that is completely fully remote. We still have our frontline workers and then we have hybrid workers and some people who are full-time in the office. So we have uh, the whole gamut of types of employees. And so, um, you know, we've found that just the ambassador network is critical to our ability to customize our approach to all of those unique work groups. And so, um, you know, when everyone during the pandemic was, um, you know, just looking for something good to do, you know, and looking to do something good in the world, um, we really leaned into that and, and looked for ways to get them involved. And so there's only um, three of us on our outreach team who are doing our employee impact work. And so that's also another reason why this champion model, our ambassador model, is um, just really necessary, frankly, to be able to meet the needs of all of our unique work groups, all of the subcultures and all of our different types of uh, environments. Uh, and um, we're just excited to be able to arm them now and equip them with the things that they need post-pandemic to be able to get out there and get uh, involved in their communities. Great. That's great. Thank you for sharing, Rachel. Melissa, over to you. Um, anything related to the pandemic, how it impacted HPE and your champions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all lived it. We all under understand the shift that had to happen um, and can probably all vividly understand the first couple weeks of like, oh, it'll pass. And then like, oh, this is reality. What are we going to do? Um, and I think in that shift, our champions network really relied on each other. And uh, it proved to me even more the impact that our champion network could have and the strength of the network. The global perspective of the, the pandemic was so different for everyone. So at times our champions call shifted from updates to, okay, let's do a mental check-in. Who's where in the world? How can we support each other on a different level? So I think we learned to adapt during this time together and also used it as a way to rethink how we work together. Um, we pulled together a ton of virtual volunteer opportunities immediately and used them as touch points for team members. Like instead of, of coffee talks, it's coffee talks and support one of these nonprofit organizations. Um, but I think even as we progressed and learned how to work virtually with one another, it, it helped us realize how we can use each other's experiences to identify needs that we may have or resources that might be impactful going forward or helpful and not be hesitant to ask because now you know that someone else in a different region is likely having the same um, barrier or challenge in promoting the activities. So it's a challenging time for all, but the, I think the positive things that can come out of it is, you know, we completely changed our toolkits that we provide for our champions. We kind of speak to each other in a different way because we understand each other and understand that we are in different places um, all the time. Um, and I think we all realize that our traditional sense of engagement, what that picture looked like, can adapt and will continue to adapt. And we have to be ready for this when it happens and accepting of it happening rather than knowing that, oh, this is our toolkit, this is our, you know, our plan, and this is how it's going to be going forward. That's just not realistic anymore. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think we've come out on the other side stronger and really um, seeing the power of the champion network even more following the pandemic. Love that. It it also helps connect the dots between 
their role as sort of culture champions, but having this sort of subset of employees who can lean on each other when the company is going through through change because the world is going through change. They have a lifeline to one another and um, it just, again, shows cases the benefits of potentially implementing this kind of model at a company. So thank you. Okay, I've got two last questions for you, ladies, um, and I'll just ask you to each answer one of these or to answer both of these questions. So you've all painted a picture about where you are. I'd love to know about your plans for the future with these models, sort of what's on the horizon. And Diane, I will turn it to you first. Sure. Uh, future plans. Um, well, we did a gap analysis to see where we had coverage or not. And right now, three of our teammates are acting as a centralized working group who are making sure that we're accounting for all aspects of what the volunteer managers would need to be successful in their role in this new environment. So we do expect to see natural growth of our volunteer management team during Global Community Day season, which is this June, to help support activities. Um, but additionally, our plan is to start actively recruiting new volunteer managers in the fall via a nomination process so that we once again have a full set of volunteer managers before the end of the year. Um, we also plan to engage with them via a monthly cadence of touch points and on-demand trainings. And we're promoting the volunteer manager role as a leadership slash development opportunity. And as Melissa had uh, kind of alluded to building out the succession plan in case someone leaves and we need to backfill that role. Um, there were a lot of gaps after the pandemic and, and we realized, wow, we, we really did not have a plan for that. So we're, we're beginning to put that in place. Um, our risk and controls environment has also tightened significantly over the last six months, which has been so fun. Um, <laughs> So we've been um, really hard at work recodifying our program guidelines mm -hmm. and additionally we're for reformatting and formalizing our volunteer management training where they must complete the basic platform training through our learning management system where their participation is recorded and if they don't complete the training their advanced system access will be revoked. Um, and we've also added some attestations to our platform to ensure that we're providing controls around community partner review and selection as well. Um, we jokingly say that the C at City stands for change, um, and there's a lot of that on the horizon, but I think we're up to the challenge. Awesome. Yes, I know you are for sure, <laughs> especially with your just all of your varied experiences there within the team. Melissa, tell us a little bit about what's on the horizon at HPE. Absolutely. So um, similar to Diane, I think one of the things that's always top of mind is analyzing the gaps in the program, whether that be resources, whether that be sites that um, are growing and we need additional champions or resources there. So we continue to do an ongoing analysis of the program who do we have? Who's a strong champion? Who needs additional support? But I think what it comes down to, um, or what's most top of mind in the near future, is really focusing on those resources. Um, like I said, we have uh, toolkits for the majority of our campaigns. So it's suggested text, either for email, for newsletters, for you know Slack posts, whatever it may be. Um, but really analyzing which of those are most helpful and uh, making sure that we have them for our champions, regardless of what we are promoting. Um, we also have a strong focus toward reporting impact now. So we have designed and we are about to implement some more templates for our champions to be able to standardize how they collect the impact of their programs, um, both so that they um, see it themselves, and it's a great point, but they also now can go to their managers or their executives and show the importance of the work that they're doing. Um, so it can come back as a positive light for all the, their work as well. Um, and we really just take into consideration, like I said, all the feedback that they provide, and we have a pipeline of different um, resources or um, 
different iterations of our program that we're trying to fine tune for the benefit of our champions going forward. Wonderful. We're going to do a follow up webinar with Melissa once those templates for collecting impact data are released and she's ready to share, right? I'm going to put that down for a future. <laughs> okay, Rachel, tell us a little bit about future plans at Southwest. Yes, uh, first and foremost, we are looking to stabilize our network of volunteer ambassadors, backfilling some roles that have been empty for a while, making sure our uh, resources are you know, useful and available to them for all the ways that they're involved in their community. Um, but I mentioned before, we have 18,000 new hires. And so educating and going on an awareness campaign essentially for our new employees is really going to be necessary. Even this morning, my team and I were on a meeting with our recruitment and talent acquisition team and figuring out how to work the stories that we have at our dis disposal into our employer brand and into our onboarding experience. Um, and then we're also uh, partnering with our national premier partners, the organizations that we have a long history with that we know our employees love to be involved in, getting some custom resources specifically for those organizations on specific ways and easy ways they can serve them. Um, and then, as you know, we are uh, assessing our Tickets for Time program um, to make sure that we are, you know, recognizing and rewarding our employees in a way that's meaningful to them. Um, I saw a lot of the Q&As were about, what do you mean by recognition? How are you rewarding everybody? And so um, our Tickets for Time program is our version as an airline of our Dollars for Doers program, where uh, for every 40 hours, um, that an organization banks as far as employee hours who have volunteered with them. It could be any number of employees. When they hit 40 hours, they get a free uh, round trip ticket. Um, and so we're assessing that, that program right now. And we're also looking into other ways that people can uh, do good in their communities beyond volunteering. It's that learn, serve, give approach and encouraging acts of kindness and other ways to just give back that aren't necessarily driven uh, by volunteer service. Love it. You ladies will be very busy, it sounds like, over the next few months into the next few years, but it does show sort of that cycle of, of how you can help sustain the program over time. Right. Okay. My last question for you, Lainey, since I know our attendees are dying to hear, what is one piece of advice you'd give to your peers who are interested in implementing this type of model? Rachel, I'll actually turn it back to you to answer first. One piece of sure. advice. Um, I have two, sorry. <laughs> so my two pieces of advice are look at your internal resources and champions who are already doing that work. Utilize them, talk to them. And then my second piece of advice is surveying and finding out what motivates your employees. Um, if you're not motivating them in the way that they care about, then you're not gonna have any traction. Totally agree with that. I love a good survey and getting data. Melissa, how about you? One piece of advice for your peers. Yeah, um, my actual, my piece of advice is something that you mentioned briefly earlier too, is that there's no right or wrong way of doing it. Do what makes the most sense for your particular company. But when you're doing it, make sure that it's thoughtful and authentic. You can stick to it, um, that you're empowering champions to drive the mission forward. Um, and like I've said a million times today, but I'm all about the feedback. So make sure that there's a channel for you to provide feedback so you can adapt and learn from whatever approach you, you choose. Absolutely. Always room for improvements. Diane, if you'll finish this out with some great piece of advice. You bet. Um, as I mentioned, we have a presence and active volunteer programming in more than 90 countries. So we definitely wouldn't be able to do what we do at the scale that we do it without being extremely thoughtful about it. So my three words of advice would be prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, before you begin to build your network, Think about what it is that you're trying to achieve, the story that you want to tell, how you plan to ensure that everyone that you're folding into your volunteer champion family is on the same page and feels prepared. Um, take the time to document your program guidelines and parameters so that way when you do your outreach, you can clearly define your expectations for the role. 
Um, additionally, meet in advance with any other lines of business that you plan on collaborating with, be it communications or HR. Um, so that way you're all aligned and ready to go. Um, in order to get and keep people engaged and committed to supporting your initiative, you have to have a strong operational model. And don't get so bogged down in kind of the cerebral stuff that you forget the heart of why we do what we do. Your volunteer managers truly are the front line who are delivering your programming to your colleagues and volunteerism should make you feel good. So don't forget to bake in the fun. Brilliant. Thank you, ladies, so much. So we're going to turn now to, I think, just one hopeful, unfortunate audience question. I saw a bunch coming through, and I think this one might encompass a lot. Speaking of recognition, does anyone here, Diane, you may actually be the right person to answer this question since you mentioned this briefly. Does anyone encourage their volunteer champions to include their participation on performance reviews? since we know the great professional development that comes from serving in this position, or do you have other mechanisms to recognize their leadership? Anyone? Tell us a little bit about it, Diane, if you want to start, that's great. Yeah, I can add a little bit. I mean, that's still something that we're working on. Um, yeah. I would say that some folks definitely do. You know, their, their manager has certainly acknowledged that they are participating in this role when they approve them um, in the system. Um, and, you know, we've done things along the years from having our CEO send a special message after big campaigns to thank them for their service, because a lot of them are acting as volunteers. You know, the only person that has this job as a full time is me and five other people. So they are truly, you know, acting as volunteers as well. Um, we have uh certainly sent our things through our newsletters to that team um, for both their participation, their feedback on how things went, things that, you know, were missing throughout the campaign that we could provide better, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, I really would love to see it kind of more formalized as um, kind of the HR side of, of the, the leadership and development piece, but that's, you know, still to come. We'll, we'll add that to your list of future yeah. events, perhaps. My little short list. I'll add that. <laughs> awesome. All right, ladies, I know we're running out of time. Um, so what we'll do is, I know we've got some other questions. What we're, we'll do with those questions to my attendees out there, we're going to uh, combine them and then share them with uh, Rachel, Diane, and Melissa, get their answers, and then we may write a blog. So stay tuned to our blog to help answer more questions around employee champions and those council models that you're thinking about employing at your company. Your answer might also lie in that white paper I mentioned briefly at the beginning um, that we've recently published. So we'll drop a link to that white paper in the chat again, just for our attendees to take a look at. And um, there's a lot of great information, but you know, nothing is better than bringing these programs to life like Diane, Melissa, and Rachel have done today. So I would like to once again, thank you all for being here with us. You live and breathe the successes and challenges that come from leading employee champions every day. And we so appreciate, I know our attendees would agree, we so appreciate learning from you and hearing how um, each of these programs works within your company. To my attendees here today, I'd love uh, to also thank you for taking time from your day. We know everyone is busy, but this is a, a wonderful strategy to help scale uh, and drive success for your social impact strategies. So it's wonderful that you had a chance to be here and listen in to these experts. Um, you'll be receiving an email later today with a recording of our webinar for those who are asking, um, along with a few key takeaways that we were able to collect. That email will also include a short survey. And we're actually gonna drop a link in the chat to that survey um, so that you can share your feedback with us to help shape future Points of Light webinars. And if you happen to have one takeaway you wanna share with us now, something that really resonated with you, we'd love for you to put that in the chat. And of course, we couldn't have provided such an excellent learning opportunity without the help of so many of my Points of Light teammates. So my sincere thanks to each one of them. Finally, right before we run out of time, I'd like to invite one of those fantastic teammates of mine, Rick Bell, Senior Vice President of Corporate Partnerships, to close us out with additional information on how Points of Light can help you in your company's 
CSR journey. Rick, if you'll come on screen, I am going to share this last slide and you can help close us out. Thanks, Katie, and, and thanks panelists and attendees as well. And whether you're looking to revamp your employee champion program or start a new program or just need help with your employee engagement strategy and implementation overall, Point to Light is here to help. And uh, we'd love to have a conversation if if you'd love to, if you'd like to as well. We can help you with everything from equipping your employees, looking at your strategy, thinking about your consumers, and or just connecting with peers as we've done today as well. But we're here to help. We're here to, to support you as well. You can find information here. Love to have a conversation uh, moving forward as well. Thank you again to everyone for your time. I know we're at time now. We appreciate it and love to stay connected with you and, and, and continue this great conversation and dialogue as well. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day and, and weekend coming up. And thanks for attending again. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody.